Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. Yeah. Um, today we're looking at a period of history that is kind of a wild ride. Yeah. Every... We're going to be going from the Roaring Twenties through the Great Depression and right up to the start of World War II. That's right. We've got a lot of different sources to work with today. We do. We've got some academic texts, historical accounts. Uh, we've even got some primary source documents and infographics in here. It's going to be a really interesting journey. It is. It's going to be quite a journey, a lot to unpack. Absolutely. So one of the things that is so interesting about this period is how the 1920s, a decade known for this incredible economic boom, yeah. actually kind of set the stage for that devastating crash of 1929. You know, we often think about these events in isolation. Right. But they're very deeply intertwined. Yeah, they really are. It's like a chain reaction almost. It is. And one of the things that we're going to be exploring in this deep dive is this emergence of this culture of credit yeah. in the 1920s. Yes. Before this time, you know, people didn't really buy things on credit. Right. But all of a sudden, everyone is buying radios, cars, you know, all on installment plans. Yeah, there's a huge change. There's a huge change. A really big shift. What was behind that shift? I think a few things were happening all at the same time. Okay. So you've got mass production techniques. Yeah. You know, like the assembly line. Right. That Henry Ford pioneered. That made goods more affordable. Right. Yeah. So businesses, they realize that they can sell a lot more if people are able to buy now. Right. And pay later. And that's where these installment plans come exactly. in. Exactly. Okay. And banks start pushing consumer credit really hard. Interesting. Targeting this growing middle class that's eager for all these new gadgets and appliances. So it sounds like, you know, everyone is getting a little, maybe a little too comfortable with this idea of being in debt. Yeah, you could definitely say that. Yeah. The whole system was built on this kind of shaky foundation. What happens if people lose their jobs or have some unexpected bills? Right. They can't make their payments. And then when enough people can't pay, yeah. the whole thing just collapses. Wow. Our sources have this really interesting case study. Okay about this family, the Millers from Cleveland, uh -huh. pretty typical middle-class family. Mm -hmm. And they got completely caught up in the stock market craze. Yeah. Buying stocks on margin, they lost absolutely everything when the market crashed. That's a really powerful story. It is. Because it shows just how quickly things can change. Absolutely. You yeah. know, yeah. good times, they don't always last. Especially if you're overextended. Oh, right, especially if you're overextended. Yeah. Now, to really understand the full impact of this crash, we need to kind of zoom out a little bit Okay. and look at how the American economy at this time was really tied into the global economy. It's all connected. It's all connected, yeah. yeah. And a great example of this is the Dawes Plan. Yes. Which was created in 1924. So this was a plan, and tell me if I'm getting this right, but I believe this was a plan that was put together to try to help Germany pay their World War I reparations. That's exactly right. Okay, and to stabilize Europe. Yeah, that was the goal, at least. Okay. So the idea was American banks would loan money to Germany. Okay. Germany would then use that money to pay reparations to Britain and France. Right. And then Britain and France could use that money to repay their war debts to the United States. So it's kind of this, like, this big circle, this flow. It's the circle of money, yeah. Yeah. On paper, it sounds kind of simple. Yeah, it sounds straightforward. Right. But looking back, was there a flaw in this plan? Oh, there was a major flaw. Okay. The whole system made European recovery completely dependent on American credit. Right. So it created this illusion of stability. Uh -huh. But it was masking these deeper problems in the global financial system. Right. And then when the American stock market crashed in 1929, yeah. those problems were suddenly exposed. And the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, it all came crashing down. So it wasn't just a collapse. It was like this global financial earthquake. It really was. It really was. And I think about the scenes that are described in our sources. Yeah. You know, panic outside the banks. Yeah. People losing their life savings. Yeah. Businesses going bankrupt. Yeah. It was devastating. Yeah. And it wasn't just limited to the United States. Right. It was a global crisis. It was a global crisis. So how did this play out in other countries? Well, let's take Great Britain as an example. Okay. So they were a major global power. Right. Huge empire. Vast empire. Yeah. But their banks were heavily invested in German debt, uh -huh. which suddenly became worthless. Wow. The pound sterling their currency right. was put under immense pressure. Yeah. Eventually, they're forced off the gold standard in 1931. 
And just for people who might not know, yeah. what was the gold standard? Yeah, so the gold standard was basically a system where a country's currency was directly linked to a fixed amount of gold. So it was supposed to provide stability. Okay. But it also limited a country's ability to kind of control its own monetary policy. Okay, so it's a trade-off. Exactly. Gotcha. And when confidence in the system eroded, countries like Britain really had no choice but to abandon it. So it was a sign of just how serious this crisis had become. Absolutely. Wow. And their colonies, how did they experience all of this? Well, they were also hit hard. Okay. Take India, for example. All right. They saw their cotton exports just completely collapse. Wow. Led to widespread economic hardship. Yeah. And really fueled the movement for independence. Right. So it's having these political ramifications as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The Depression really exposed these fault lines within the British Empire. Uh-huh. And really accelerated its decline. So it's not just impacting economies. It's also shaking these, these global power structures. That's exactly right. Wow. And, you know, France, while they seemed more resilient initially, okay. they weren't immune. Their colonies in Indochina and North Africa were hit hard by falling commodity prices. Yeah. And they also ended up abandoning the gold standard in 1936. Wow. So the Depression had this domino effect. Right. It's rippling outward. Rippling across the world. Yeah. Leaving this trail of just economic and political instability in its wake. So we've got a global crisis. We've got empires that are crumbling. Yeah. Millions of people that are in despair. It's a recipe for disaster. This is setting the stage for something else, isn't it? It really is. Out of this despair and this chaos emerges a new threat. Oh. The rise of extremism, particularly in Europe. Wow. People were desperate for solutions. Yeah. And some were willing to turn to radical ideologies yeah. and authoritarian leaders who promised these simple answers and a return to glory. Yeah. Yeah. It's a scary thought. It is a scary thought. But that is a story for our next dive. You know, as we were saying last time, as that global economy spiraled downward, okay. people lost faith in their governments. Their institutions. Yeah. It was a breeding ground for extremism. It really is fascinating to see how times of crisis can push people towards these extreme solutions. Right. What were some of the factors that made extremism, you know, so appealing in the 1930s? Yeah, I mean, just imagine. Yeah. Millions are unemployed. Right. Savings are gone. Yeah. Governments seem powerless to stop this downward spiral. That scary time. People felt betrayed. They felt vulnerable. Right. They were desperate for change. Yeah. And some were willing to accept radical change. And that's where someone like Mussolini steps in. Exactly. In Italy, promising national pride. Yeah. Strength, order. Mussolini was a master of spectacle. Yeah. He really understood how to appeal to people's emotions. Right. He promised to make Italy great again. Right. A phrase that, as you know, right. still resonates today. Has a familiar ring. Yeah. And he wasn't afraid to use violence to achieve his goals. Not at all. Right. His well. black shirts. Right. This paramilitary group. Yeah. They intimidated his opponents. Yeah. His propaganda machine. Right. Churned out this vision of a glorious future. Right. Under fascist rule. It's scary how effective that can be. It is. You know, it's like this whole idea of if you repeat something enough, people will start to believe it. And he was very good at it. Yeah. And this his corporate state model. Right. With the government kind of controlling the economy, crushing dissent, became a blueprint for other dictators. It did. And one of the places that resonated most strongly was in Germany. Right. Where the Weimar Republic was really on its last legs. Now, Germany was hit particularly hard by the Depression, Amen. even more so than a lot of other countries. They were already burdened by these war reparations. Right. From World War One. From World War One. Exactly. Yeah. And when those American loans dried up, their financial system just imploded. Wow. Unemployment soared. Yeah. Hyperinflation wiped out people's savings. It's like this perfect storm. It was a perfect storm for the Nazis to exploit. And into this vacuum steps Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, yeah. offering their own brand of national salvation. They tapped into German resentment over the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. They blamed Jews and communists for the country's problems. Right. And they promised to restore Germany to its former greatness. It's a powerful message when people are feeling so lost and desperate. It is. And the Nazis were incredibly savvy propagandists. Yeah. They really knew how to manipulate people's fears and their anxieties. They did. And their rise to power was shockingly swift. It really was, wasn't it? It was. By 1933, Hitler was chancellor. Wow. And within a few years, Germany was a totalitarian state. 
it's chilling how quickly a democracy can just crumble like that. It really is. When people are afraid, desperate for answers. It's a sobering reminder of how fragile democracy can be. It is. And it wasn't just Italy and Germany. Right. The Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936. Right. Became this battleground between fascism and democracy. That was almost a dress rehearsal for World War II, wasn't it? It was, in many ways, yeah. Franco's nationalists. Right. Backed by Hitler and Mussolini. Yeah. They eventually triumphed. Right. Establishing yet another fascist regime in Europe. So while all of this is happening in Europe, Europe is kind of descending into this darkness. Right. What's happening in the United States during this time? Well, America is grappling with its own demons. Okay. President Hoover's response to the Depression was initially very slow. Okay. And inadequate. Right. He believed in this hands-off approach. Yeah, kind of let the market fix itself. Exactly, hoping that mm. the economy would just kind of fix itself. It didn't really work out so well. It didn't work. Our sources describe this, this growing frustration, yeah. despair yeah. that culminated in that Bonus Army March in 1932. It's a powerful image. It is. Thousands of World War I veterans yeah. marching on Washington, D.C. Demanding early payment of a bonus they had been promised. That must have been an incredibly tense situation. It was. And Hoover's decision to use the Army to disperse the veterans. Wow. Many of whom were homeless and desperate. Yeah. Further tarnished his image. Right. And it really highlighted the government's inability to address this crisis. Right. So it's against this backdrop of despair. Yeah. And this government inaction that FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, yeah. is elected president in 1932. Right. Promising a new deal for the American people. A new deal. A new deal. He understood that bold action was needed. Right. His first hundred days in office saw this flurry of legislation yeah. aimed at providing relief. Right. Recovery well, reform. And we see programs like the WPA. Yeah, the WPA. The, the CCC. The CCC. The Triple right. yeah. These were revolutionary in their scope and ambition. They were. These programs put millions of people back to work. Yeah. Provided a safety net for the most vulnerable. Yeah. Changed the relationship between the government and its citizens. In a big way. Yeah, in a big way. Yeah. But how did these programs that were, you know, designed to address this domestic crisis. Right end up playing a role in America's mobilization for World War II? It's a really interesting question. It is. So the infrastructure built by the WPA, right. the skills developed by the CCC, yeah. the experience in managing these large-scale government programs, mm -hmm. all of this proved to be invaluable yeah. when America was thrust into this global conflict. So the New Deal, in a way, unintentionally laid the groundwork for America's wartime transformation. Precisely. Uh. You take the WPA, for instance. Okay. They've been building roads and bridges and schools. Yeah. But it quickly shifted to producing war supplies. Wow. Constructing yeah. military facilities. Okay. And the CCC, which was focused on conservation, yeah. started building roads and planting trees near military bases to support readiness efforts. And the AAA, which yeah. had been trying to stabilize agricultural prices. Right. They ramped up production to ensure food supplies. Exactly, for both the military and civilians. It's remarkable how adaptable these programs turn out to be. It really is. But the war's impact went far beyond just repurposing these New Deal programs. Right. It had a profound impact on American society. Yes. Particularly for women. Absolutely. And minorities. That's right, with millions of men fighting overseas. Right. Women stepped into roles traditionally held by men. Working in factories? Yeah, factories, shipyards, offices. Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter became an icon of this new female empowerment. Exactly. However, our sources also point out the ongoing discrimination right. faced by African Americans, Latino Americans, and Japanese Americans. And the Double V campaign. Yeah, a really important movement. Launched by African Americans. Calling for victory against fascism abroad and victory against racial inequality at home. And then, of course, there's the internment of Japanese Americans. A truly dark chapter in American history. It is. Driven by these unfounded fears and prejudice. Yeah. The government incarcerated over 100,000 Japanese Americans. It's just a horrible injustice. Denying them their basic rights. It's a stark reminder that even in times of national crisis, right. the fight for equality and justice doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. That's so important to remember. It is. So while the United States is weathering the Depression, mobilizing for war, oh, another probably. power driven by its own ambitions yes. and resource scarcity yeah. 
is on the rise across the Pacific. That's right. Japan, feeling increasingly isolated, yeah. threatened by Western powers, yeah. embarks on this path of military expansion in the 1930s. Setting the stage for a clash with the United States. And that is a story for our next dive. It is. Last time we were talking about Japan's ambitions in the Pacific, and it really seemed like they were on this collision course with the U.S. Right. And like Germany, Japan felt very constrained by their lack of resources. Uh -huh. They really believed that expansion was the only way they could survive. So they were looking outward. Absolutely. And they had this idea of a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. But, well, you know. It sounds nice. It sounds good on paper, but. Yeah, but in reality, it meant a resource empire. Oh. Built through military conquest. Oh. Like, look at Manchuria, 1931. Yeah. And then all-out war with China just a few years later. Wow. They needed things like oil and rubber and tin. Or, they were taking territories that had those things. So this aggression was all about resources. I think it's fair to say that, yeah, their leaders felt like they had no other options. Right, like their backs were against the wall. Exactly. But this obviously created tension with the West. For sure, especially with the United States. Yeah. And the U.S., they responded with economic pressure, culminating in that oil embargo in 41. Right, that was a big deal. It was a huge gamble. Yeah. They wanted to force Japan to back down, but it could have also provoked a military response. And Well, it did. Yeah, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Such a pivotal moment. The attack, from Japan's point of view, was supposed to cripple the U.S. Pacific Fleet so they had more time. To kind of solidify their position. Exactly. And it worked tactically, but strategically. It backfired. Big time. Huh. It didn't scare the U.S. It just made them mad. Unified public opinion, and that was it. The U.S. was in the war. And how? They mobilized like never before. Production shifted to war. Millions were drafted. The government was running the whole economy. And like we talked about before, all that New Deal stuff ended up being super helpful. Absolutely. All that infrastructure, the experience with big government programs, it all paid off. So the U.S. became the arsenal of democracy. Exactly. Not just for their own troops, but for the Allies, too. And we were talking about resources earlier. This was a war for resources, right? Absolutely. People tend to forget that. It wasn't just about territory. It was about stuff you needed to fight. To keep your armies going, to keep people fed. Exactly. And the differences there in how countries manage those resources, mm. that had a huge impact on who won and who lost. Can you give us some examples? Sure. Look at the American soldiers. They were unbelievably well supplied like over 4,000 calories a day. <laughs> even in the Battle of the Bulge, in the middle of winter, they were getting hot meals. There's even stories about them listening to Bing Crosby on the radio. That's why. It really shows you the advantage the U.S. had. Yeah. Compare that to the Germans on the Eastern Front. Right. They were freezing to death. Hitler had decided to focus on tanks, not winter clothes. Wow. In the Pacific, Japanese soldiers on islands, they actually controlled. They were starving because they couldn't get supplies in. So these logistical things really mattered. They were huge. But maybe the most consequential decision in the whole war, that involved a very different type of resource, the atomic bomb. Yeah, by 1945, the war in the Pacific wasn't going anywhere. What yeah. led to that decision? Japan wouldn't surrender, even though they were losing badly. Uh -huh. And U.S. military planners, they were figuring out what an invasion of Japan would look like. Right. And the casualty estimates... They were horrific. Yeah. And the Manhattan Project, which had been working on the atomic bomb in secret, they were ready. So in August 1945, the U.S. used those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's still debated today. For sure. You had the desire to end the war quickly, to save American lives, to maybe scare the Soviets a bit. Mm -hmm. But somewhere between 129,000 and 226,000 people died. A horrific tragedy. It was. It ended the war, but it also brought us the nuclear age. And all the problems that come with that. Absolutely. In the aftermath, the Allies tried to build a new world order mm. based on cooperation. Right. You had the United Nations, the Bretton Woods system, the Nuremberg trials. It seemed like a real effort to build a lasting peace. It was, but it didn't last. Right. The U.S. and the Soviet Union, they couldn't make it work. Yeah. The Cold War. So much happened in such a short time. What are some of the big takeaways from all of this, from the Roaring Twenties all the way to the end of the war? I think the biggest one is how connected everything is. That boom in the 20s helped cause the Depression. That led to extremism. And then you get World War II. Like dominoes. It shows how 
things that seem isolated can have huge consequences. It makes you really think history is so complex. It really is, and there's so much we can learn from it. Absolutely, so many lessons. And I think it reminds us, more than anything, just how devastating conflict can be. Right, and how important things like diplomacy and cooperation really are. If we want a better future, we have to work for it. What a powerful message. This has been quite a journey. It has. We've gone from the heights of the Roaring Twenties to the depths of global war, and there are lessons in there that we're still grappling with today. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you keep diving deeper into the past.